Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this very special Eisenhower Institute event. I'm Bob Giuliano, the president of Gettysburg College, and it's truly a privilege to serve as a host for tonight's conversation. Over the course of the next hour, we will explore the life and legacy of a truly remarkable leader, one who helped shape the course of events like few others and a very good friend to this college, our nation's 34th president, Dwight D. Eisenhower. We know this, leadership matters, and in President Eisenhower, there are many lessons to be learned about what effective leadership looks like. These lessons are both timeless and timely, as today we, set, we face a set of challenges, economic, political, social, medical, that are testing the very fabric of our society. There is much to learn from the wisdom and the perspective offered by President Eisenhower. Our discussion is timely in a second respect as well. It takes place on the heels of the dedication of the new Eisenhower Memorial in Washington, DC. The memorial, which is located just south of the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum, is a deeply reflective and breathtaking tribute to the words and deeds of President Eisenhower. Although I was invited to attend last week's dedication ceremony, I regret that I was unable to attend, but my wife and I very much look forward to visiting it soon, perhaps guided by tonight's featured speaker. Now, of course, the catalyst for tonight's conversation is the launch of a remarkable new book, How Ike Led, The Principles Behind Eisenhower's Biggest Decisions. It is a truly fascinating and important scholarly work authored by our very own Susan Eisenhower, who joins us here this evening. Susan is one of President Eisenhower's four grandchildren, and she is the co-founder and expert in residence of the Eisenhower Institute. As a consultant and policy strategist, she has contributed decades worth of insightful work focused on national security, um, on a variety of other topics, uh, including strategic leadership. Through the Eisenhower Institute, Susan offers an undergraduate program entitled Strategy and Leadership in Transformational Times, which our students affectionately call SALT for short. The program highlights the vital intersection between strategy and leadership while emphasizing the uniquely transformational times in which we are living today. In my year plus since I've been on campus, I have heard from students, current students and alumni, just how powerfully influenced they have been uh, by the SALT program and by Susan's leadership and teaching. I know this as well. It also matters enormously to Susan, and that is reflected by something that really moved me, and that is her decision to dedicate her book to Gettysburg College SALT students and to the rising generation of students across the country. For those of you who have previously engaged with Susan, either through your partnerships in DC or through the Eisenhower Institute, you know that she believes strongly in the promise of today's aspiring young leaders. Of course, at Gettysburg College, we too share in this belief and a belief that we provide an education here that cannot be replicated elsewhere. Indeed, our Eisenhower Institute students are shaped by the benefits of two unique vantage points with physical locations, both in our nation's capital, just steps away from the White House and on the hallowed grounds of this campus. In addition, our students course is shaped by two remarkable presidents, President Eisenhower and Abraham Lincoln, whose legacies are forever entwined with the history of this college and who led this country through the existential challenges of their centuries. Certainly, ours is an education grounded in the les lessons of history but we likewise set a determined eye to the future as we seek to bridge today's divide and bring about an understanding for those most pressing issues. At its heart, Susan's new book does the same. She masterfully explores Ike's accomplishments as a leader, but she also signs a light on many other vital elements he possessed, including his focus and his empathy, which, from which we can all learn as we look to strengthen the bonds of our democracy and our society in these difficult times. So again, I wanna thank you for joining us today. And Susan, I wanna congratulate you on what I found to be a truly incredible, informative work. 
One quick word on our format tonight. Susan and I will begin a conversation about the book and its lessons. We will then open it up for questions. We invite you to join the conversation by submitting questions through Zoom's Q&A feature or by commenting on Facebook live stream. So thank you. Susan, let me begin with a foundational question. Why this book and why now? Well, first of all, let me thank you so much, uh, Bob, for this wonderful opportunity. And it's great to be talking to uh, so many of our um, friends, colleagues, alumni uh, from Gettysburg College this evening. Uh, yes, you're absolutely right. I dedicated the book, not just to my SALT students, but to Gettysburg College students and to rising generations, because I wanted them to know that in our history, we have had uh, great leaders. I knew this particular one personally, so that offered an opportunity. Yes. Um, but that uh, there was a very different leadership style we had at that time, uh, and a different way of looking at pressing long-term issues. Uh, I also tried to um, take advantage of the fact, of course, that uh, all of us would be focused on not only the 75th anniversary of victory in Europe, but also the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II. And then, of course, uh, the dedication, which we had last week in Washington, D.C. But just to sort of end with that thought, I so hope that um, other young people um, and uh, uh, young men and women will read this book because uh, I've tried to make it readable. Um, and I've tried to, I hope I accomplished this. I, I tried to make it, uh, I, let me just say that again. I tried to show what leadership is rather than to tell what it is. Uh, and so there are a lot of anecdotes um, in the book uh, because sometimes just telling a story about somebody is more effective than providing um, you know, straight out analysis. Well, I have to say, having really enjoyed the book, uh, Susan, and experiencing those, what I almost call case studies that you mm -hmm. did through chapter two, through chapter, I think your aspirations for the book really came through. I'm going to push you a little bit into the analytical space, though, and say, <laughs> sure. um, as you reflect on all of the lessons that are revealed in the book, how would you distill the essence of your grandfather's um, principles about leadership? And then I'm going to ask you afterwards whether you think those principles are enduring or were, were they more transient? Well, I would just say that uh, the principles of Ike's leadership uh, are combined in this book with uh, a central matter that I'd like to make, put an exclamation point next to, and that is that character matters. Not only does leadership matter, but in order to be a great leader, uh, character really does play an enormous role. Um, in terms of how uh, Ike saw the world, and that's what I try uh, to uh, distill, uh, you can't really study Eisenhower the president without studying Eisenhower the general. Uh, and uh, it's important to note because he brought so much of a kind of disciplined thinking uh, to how to analyze issues, how to what he called stripping them down, stripping them down to their essence. Now, let's remember that he was a strategic leader. That means uh, he was sitting on top of uh, the organizational chart and he had to uh, bring all kinds of factors into his thinking. Uh, not only obviously logistics and timelines and resources and human resources and all of those uh, component pieces of any organization, but he also had to be thinking about the future. He had to be thinking about the present. He had to be thinking about uh, the political environment in which he was operating in, both as general and as president. So the way he, he married all of those various elements uh, was to um, put together uh, a staff that enabled him to plan thoroughly uh, around uh, what we did know at the time and what we projected would be into the future, um, and then put a very disciplined um, organizational structure together uh, to make sure that his decisions were implemented. Um, I'd just like to add here, it's kind of interesting for me, so many people think that you know, his life must have been miserable during World War II because there was so much dissension among the Allies. But you know what he did? He actually virtually replicated the organizational structure from the war and surrounded uh, himself with cabinet members and advisors who all had very different opinions. Um, I think he learned from the war that this pushback, this constant pushback, as um, unpleasant as it might be at times, um, actually helped him see the uh, complexity and the dimensions 
uh, actually of any complicated issue. Susan, you may have just answered a question that it didn't occur to me until you, you just said what you said. And that is, as you reflect on his leadership style, both as a general and as a president, did they differ? That is, did the context and the responsibilities ultimately change the way he led in those two different roles? Ah, this is so interesting because just imagine what a cultural change this man went through. As, as um, a five-star general, supreme allied commander of forces in Europe, uh, he was the boss. I mean, he had bosses, of course, Winston Churchill and Franklin Roosevelt, but he was the boss of this military operation and people followed orders. Then he leaves the, the war period and becomes president of Columbia University. Now, I, I don't have to tell you how um, different um, academic life is from the military, but you can well imagine. So this is a very, um, academia is very horizontal um, and different things matter uh, in a way that they might or might not during the war, but that was a big transition. Then he ends up uh, in retail, no, then he goes to NATO, of course, and he's got a very fractious situation there because not everybody at NATO agrees on the goal, unlike World War II. Uh, and then he becomes a retail politician. Now, I really can't think of anything uh, more varied and more um, challenging, actually, because not only is politics rather horizontal, but it is filled with uh, complexities um, about uh, party rivalries and rivalries within the party and people's motives. And then um, uh, the news media and all these other factors that became very complex, but because he had real talent at stripping down problems and relying on organization, he, he turned out to be a very successful president. I mean, it really speaks volumes of his talent that he could navigate successfully all of those wildly different environments um, <laughs> and do so again with such skill and grace. So um, let me pick on one specific illustration because it seems really revelatory to me. And it is the situation involving the perceived missile gap. And just for two mm -hmm. seconds worth of context for the people listening today, um, you describe in the book that after Sputnik, there was a degree of panic in the United States that the Soviet Union had a technological advantage. And that was bad enough when it came to Sputnik, but when it came to ICBMs and questions of domestic security, then the concern was heightened because there was really a worry that perhaps we were vulnerable um, in ways that Sputnik didn't quite amplify. Um, you suggest in the book that there wasn't in fact much of a missile gap, but the perception was really acute and it was fueled both by the media and by J JFK as he was running for office. This strikes me as a classic leadership challenge where the facts and perceptions don't align very effectively. Yeah. How did he deal with that situation? And how would that, uh, well, let me just stop there. How, how did he deal with that situation? And what lessons might we learn from that? Well, first of all, what made the situation even more complex um, is that uh, uh, the information Eisenhower had was classified. So when you're being attacked uh, by other people um, and there is a um, national security reason why you cannot um, uh, tell it like it is to the public at large, then you're kind of uh, trapped into a corner. And I think what um, uh, John Kennedy was trying to do was to actually trap Richard Nixon because he was vice president. Uh, this was going into the 1916 uh, campaign. And so, um, you know, it was a pretty, um, well, it was a pretty raucous campaign and, and Nixon couldn't say anything either. Uh, what we do know is that uh, Eisenhower had confidence that uh, there was no missile gap whatsoever. And there was not. As a matter of fact, we enjoyed a significant um, uh, a, a significant advantage over the Soviet Union in all of these technologies. Um, but the only way uh, Dwight Eisenhower could really uh, tackle the problem practically, well, there were two things. First of all, to the public, he tried to reassure them uh, that uh, things were um, in good hands, um, which of course uh, worked in some circles, but not in others. Uh, but the way he tried to uh, tackle it practically was to invite uh, JFK and Lyndon Johnson, who was his running mate, uh, to the White House um, <clears throat> and to the various uh, classified agencies and give them a classified briefing. I mean, it's a, it's a little disconcerting that after the classified briefing, they didn't stop talking about the missile gap, but that was about the best he could do 
uh, under those circumstances. Uh, later, of course, after the administration's over, uh, within a month, uh, everybody in the Kennedy administration admitted there was no missile gap. Um, but I think, um, you know, in another way, that signaled a change in the culture uh, in America because uh, we came to see threats uh, as a powerful political tool. I'm not sure it starts there, but it's certainly amplified. And this is one of the big challenges we face today. It's true. And of course, your grandfather had a role in a different form of threat with McCarthyism and the, and the effort that he took um, to, behind the scenes in a sense, diffuse um, McCarthy from many of the negative impacts that he was having on American society. So he was skilled in multiple dimensions. Well, if I could just um, uh, say something about McCarthy, uh, you know, there's a kind of naive analysis here that uh, if I could uh, ascended the bully pulpit and used that opportunity to attack Joe McCarthy, uh, that it would do any good. Uh, the truth is, is that the Truman administration tried that tactic and it only made McCarthy more powerful. Uh, I think Ike would have looked at a really central thing for any leader, and that is, uh, and you see this theme running throughout the book, he was excellent at an analyzing what he controlled and what he didn't control. Uh, and he made great leveraged use out of what he controlled. But in the case of McCarthy, the President of the United States, being the head of a co-equal branch of government, cannot censure a sitting senator. That has to come from the senators themselves. So he had to work behind the scenes to make sure that he didn't offend McCarthy's supporters because he needed them to finally uh, censure Senator McCarthy. So there is some complexity to it, and it's, it becomes a rather exciting story when you look at uh, the various things he had to manage, including, by the way, the members of his own political party. Well, you, it's interesting that you say he knew what he could control and focused on that. I have to imagine that his military background played an important role in that, yeah. because he, he's got the troops, he's got the uh, uh, capacities, and that's what he's got to deal with. Um, so with Justice Ginsburg's passing, there is a lot of conversation going on about um, like overheated rhetoric, perhaps, um, about um, how she should be replaced. Um, and you speak in the book about your grandfather's um, approach to the selection of Supreme Court justices. Um, would you reflect a little bit on how he thought about that? And I said overheated rhetoric. I don't quite mean it in that way, because I think this is an important moment for the Supreme Court. So how would you see your grandfather thinking about the appointments he made to the Supreme Court and how those lessons might apply to the conversations that are going on now and the decisions that we are gonna face in replacing Justice Ginsburg? Well, I think that's an excellent question. Uh, there are a couple of things I think in terms of context that are worth noting. Uh, you remember Dwight Eisenhower was a, a general and didn't even vote until uh, after the war. Um, so. Uh, most, uh, both political parties wanted him to run. They thought they had a shot because nobody knew whether he was a Democrat or Republican. So I think it's worth noting that he's probably um, arguably one of the most nonpartisan presidents we've ever had, except for perhaps uh, George Washington. And you might be able to find another one, but I'd like to debate that with somebody because I, I'm not so sure. In any case, that's, that's part of what he brought with him to the White House. He believed in the middle way, okay? Uh, but he also, um, having studied the Constitution and having uh, vowed to dedicate his life to defending the Constitution, even from the moment he went to West Point, um, he understood that we have three co-equal branches of government. And the Supreme Court is an unelected co-equal branch of the government. And therefore, in Eisenhower's view, it deserved to reflect ideological balance, not just ratio of gender balance, but ideological balance. So it's rather stunning, actually, that uh, um, uh, in the run up to the 1956 uh, election, Ike um, appointed William Brennan, uh, who was a Catholic Democrat, uh, to sit on the Supreme Court. And then he sat back and he said, uh, with some of his other uh, key appointments, like uh, Earl Warren uh, and others, he, he stood back and he said, well, that's feeling a little more ideologically balanced. 
his um, attorney general, uh, Herbert Brownell, was very proud in his memoirs to note that by the end of the Eisenhower administration, the whole federal bench was pretty much ideologically balanced. So um, I don't know, there'd have to be some big uh, cultural change in this country today to go back to that sort of concept, but it might uh, also benefit all of us to understand more about uh, the basic structure of the Constitution and um, you know how Ike saw this uh, as a way to inspire confidence uh, in our government and that having um, friends on the court for everybody uh, would be a way for everyone to accept the results of the court's rulings. Was his um, philosophy about appointing justices um, ideological balance distinctive at that time? Was it a departure from what prior presidents had done? I think you'd see, you saw some of that in uh, previous presidents. Of course, I studied this one because I was <laughs> uh, working on this book, but I am told by a lawyer that, oh, this reminds me of another case some time ago. But we have come so far away from even giving that consideration. And part of it is, is because literally everything in our society is politicized. Uh, people mix up politics with policy, and they should be, in theory, two different things. You mentioned the middle way. Can you say a word or two more about what that meant to him and how it played out in the way that he governed? Well, I'll tell you one of my favorite quotes in the book, and I'm sorry I don't have it here with me, but he basically says that he He's worried about the time when uh, the extremes on the left and the right side dominate the public space. Um, and he, he understood the divisions. It was a very divided time actually after World War II because of the Korean War and high inflation. We were still on wartime footing. Uh, and he was very worried about extremism because he, he spent his wartime career um, fighting one of the most extreme ideologies that the world has seen, and that's Nazism. Uh, he uh, conceived of this idea of a middle way, which would be a sort of common ground, a common viewpoint, where people from both sides, uh, both parties, uh, could compose their differences, um, compromise, and fi find ways to move this country forward. Um, and he was really quite successful at that. Uh, for the six years that uh, the opposition party, the Democrats, uh, controlled both houses of Congress, he passed 80% uh, of his legislative agenda. That's remarkable. Mm. Um, so we've spent, I want to remind folks to please um, submit your questions. Uh, in a few minutes, we're gonna, I'm going to turn to those. We spent a fair amount of time so far talking about your grandfather's approach as a general and as a president. And that certainly reveals a lot about his character, but you obviously saw him um, through a different light as well. And that is as a person. And one of the sweetest stories in the whole book to me is a story about an inattentive granddaughter, some horses and a putting green. Can no. you say a word or two about that experience <laughs> and perhaps what it revealed about your grandfather? Well, this is, um, you know, we're still laughing about this story at home. I think I'm the only one who's not laughing because this is, <clears throat> this is what's called life, lifelong guilt. But um, many of you know who, um, you know, spent their academic careers um, here in Gettysburg will remember uh, Eisenhower and the Gettysburg Country Club. What few people uh, realize is that he actually had a putting green installed at the farm uh, so that he could go out, you know, for a couple of putts uh, in between doing his correspondence or working on another book. And uh, I, we all, you know, respected the fact that he enjoyed that privacy and the chance to do something just real quick. Um, so anyway, uh, I was the family horseback rider and I started very young. And uh, this is a good indication of how young I was because I was supposed to be putting the horses away for the night out in a paddock. And I was daydreaming or doing something and five of these animals pushed the gate open and then went running around. I can close my eyes and still see this because first of all, they ran up the lane and then they ran over my grandparents' lawn. This is at uh, dusk when my grandparents like to sit out uh, on the porch and watch the flags being lowered on the flagpole um, just in front of their view. And then these five horses took a big sweep and ran right over Ike's putting green. 
Um, and uh, I understood instantly, uh, I'm in big trouble. And uh, uh, I, I rounded up a few of the farm hands and then the horses are still running around. We got the secret service out. We had everybody out trying to round up these animals. And then after we finally did that, then we had to go in front of granddad and my uh, grandmother and replace the divots on the putting green. <laughs> oh my gosh. So by this time, not only have the horses wrecked the golf green, um, but I'm late for dinner. Um, <laughs> so um, I went into the house. I, I really, I thought about running away from home. I thought about, um, uh, then I thought, no, I think in this family you report for duty. So I <laughs> decided to <clears throat> go in and I entered the sun porch there and he liked to sit in that swivel chair so we could watch TV and then swivel around and contribute to the conversation, you know, when the evening news was on. And I stood at the door there and he swiveled around and he said, oh, wow, you know what I said to your grandmother? I haven't seen horses run like that since uh, I was a kid in Abilene, Kansas. And that was, and then I, of course, apologized. I think I got scored some points for taking full and complete responsibility <laughs> uh, for the mistake. But, you know, he never held it over my head. And I think this is where he was really remarkable is that he could read people very well. He was a he was a great observer of men and women, and, and he loved little kids. So he knew, you know, he knew that uh, I was already devastated, and he was right about that. <laughs> well, and you note in the book that it also was reflected in part in the way he led people as well, that mm -hmm. people could make mistakes, and he accepted that um, and tried to cultivate both their trust and their recognition of how to get better, in a sense. I think that's very important. You know, today we're completely obsessed with the ideas of um, am I a winner or am I a loser in other people's eyes? If you'd known Dwight Eisenhower, you would have never uh, had to answer that question for yourself because he believed in uh, growing maturity. He, he believed in second uh, and third chances. Uh, he believed that it takes people time to grow up and to develop into the kind of human beings they're going to become and that the challenge is to encourage them in the right direction, not to be writing them off at an early stage. And in my research, I saw many examples of that. And it was really actually rather inspiring for me because I so care about the students at the college I'm so fortunate to be part of. And I try and convey to SALT students um, that you've got, you've got time, just go with all of us at the college on that journey. So um, I think actually that's one of the most important points I make in the book. It's, it's great advice. Um, uh, last question for me before I get to the questions from our audience. And that is, um, I so enjoyed watching the dedication online uh, and your comments in particular. And the, the memorial is a tribute to the remarkable life that your grandfather lived from his humble childhood roots in America's heartland uh, to his time at Gettysburg, to um, his leadership in World War II, to his leadership as the United States president. Um, how do you interpret the significance of the memorial, both to the country, but also to you and your family? Well, first of all, it's, a, it's, a, it's really an overwhelming uh, honor and, um, you know, I, I feel quite emotional about the whole thing. I was very much involved in uh, trying to, um, you know, think about how to find a memorial that would be monumental. There were all sorts of uh, designs and controversies at various points. Um, but I think the thing that um, means, two things mean uh, uh, something special to me. First of all, we went through that whole process. Uh, always remembering the fact that Congress had actually designated this memorial and had done so with the idea of representing Eisenhower's uh, wartime leadership and his peacetime leadership, or I should say his presidential leadership that happened to be a peaceful um, administration. Uh, and that was, there was a lot of responsibility. Uh, my brother was on the commission uh, and I later um, helped uh, find a compromise to what is there today. The thing that's really exciting about it for me, and, it, and, and this is sort of a double honor here, is that the memorial design today is better than it was in the beginning. And everybody's happy with it, it's amazing. And to me, it's always going to represent what I tried to do, 
which was to bring everybody together and have them compose their differences. So for me personally, it's a symbol of the importance of A, a middle way, uh, and B, uh, finding solutions that make the end result better um, than it was before. Uh, the other thing is, it's, please note when you're in Washington that I think it's the, uh, if it's not the only one, it's one of very, very few memorials where the great man is actually with people. And uh, we really argued for that as a wonderful element because he would have said, you know, this was a team. I led the team, but this was a team effort. So we're very happy with it, with the wonderful monumental uh, idea of the beaches of Normandy in peacetime, which was not only the turning point for America in the war, but the turning point for him personally. Well, and you have brought our students to the beaches of Normandy to help them understand the context and the significance of, of that moment in time. And I know that has really mattered to them enormously. It's mattered to me too. <laughs> um, I'm going to turn to some of the questions and the first two are related. Um, and the first one is a team of rivals, which as you know, Doris Kearns Goodwin wrote about the Lincoln administration. Um, this, this questioner asks, could have been written about Eisenhower's approach to military and political leadership as well as you were describing. Um, was he a student of Lincoln is the question and might it have influenced his leadership philosophy? Well, it's interesting. Uh, Eisenhower had uh, two heroes, uh, George Washington, um, he was very, very interested in from a scholarly perspective. And I think actually um, philosophically and um, personality wise, um, he, is, he is a rather Washington-like figure, uh, you know, a middle of the road or a non-political um, figure who uh, had a military background. So I think um, Eisenhower identified specifically um, with uh, George Washington. But having said that, he had a personal relationship with Abraham Lincoln. And I'll tell you why that is very quickly. The Eisenhowers uh, were part of a Mennonite uh, subgroup called the River Brethren. And uh, Eisenhower's, uh, Ike, Ike's parents were uh, pacifists. They did not fight in the Civil War, um, though they wanted to make their views, um, Ike's grandparents wanted to make their views very clear um, so uh, Ike's uncle was named Abraham Lincoln Eisenhower. So we actually have an Abraham Lincoln <laughs> Eisenhower in the family. Um, and so of course uh, he was fascinated by uh, Lincoln. I'm sure he was uh, influenced by Lincoln as well. Uh, how could he not be? Uh, he chose to retire to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. And by the way, probably give one of the most interesting battlefield tours ever. <laughs> oh, I would have liked to have heard that. Uh, Me too. <laughs> absolutely. You know, this is a question of my own now, based upon what you've just said and the question that was asked. Did his philosophy of leadership emerge by virtue of experience, or did he study questions of leadership? And was it in part um, um, a learned experience by virtue of what he was able to study? Well, he was not only a, uh, he not only observed and studied men and women and their behavior. So I, I, I think that he had really a tremendous sense of human nature, but he was a great um, scholar actually on military history and on uh, ancient societies. Um, and he had a, a certain uh, favoritism towards big, um, uh, well, I would say big strategic issues, grand, grand strategy and the rest of it. Uh, in 1915, his West Point class did a staff ride of the Gettysburg battlefield, and he was so turned off. He said, if this is, if this is military history, I want no part of it. Mm -hmm. Why? Because the instructor from West Point was saying, now, you have to memorize where every general and every colonel was and where every unit uh, was and this and that. And all, all I wanted to know was uh, how much information did the commanders have? Uh, why did they make that decision? How would that decision have been different if they had uh, known more or um, what would have happened uh, to the outcome if different things had happened? You know, he, he, won, he was up in the, um, you know, at the strategic le uh, leadership level in terms of interest. Uh, but, you know, I have to say, Bob, that he would have never been a great strategic leader if he hadn't been a very good operational leader, too. He, he used all of his experiences in, in the earlier years uh, to learn about things that actually turned about, out to be exceedingly important, like tanks, 
And as we know, he uh, commanded the Tank Corps in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania during the First World War. Uh, tanks, logistics, uh, and even how to scale up a war. That was his responsibility in the 1930s, was to write, um, you know, write a plan for a scaling up industry um, uh, for, for the war effort. Uh -huh. So he had a, a wealth of information that was really very useful. So the next question is a bit related to the first one. It sounds like he was a clear student of military history and that influenced the way he approached his career in the military. Was he also a, then a student of presidential history and did that influence the way he approached the presidency? Well, that's, that's uh, I'm, I'm sure he was just because he was um, fascinated um, by our system. He had, um, as I, I said, when he became a cadet, he um, vowed to um, serve the Constitution of the United States and the United States of America. And then I'll tell you a, a very interesting little story, as a matter of fact. He came from a very learned household, despite the fact that they were uh, farmers in, in um, Kansas. And uh, his father was a great reader of um, civics. And so I'm sure that at home they got, he got lots of lessons about civics. Um, and I have to say, he was interested in military history, but he was interested in, in all forms of history, too. Um, and uh, as a matter of fact, his class at Abilene predicted that uh, he would grow up to be a renowned history teacher at Yale. <laughs> well, not exactly. His brother was, uh, according to the uh, yearbook, uh, destined to be president of the United States. And so none of that worked out. <laughs> it got a little bit backwards, perhaps. I mean, exactly. Um, different question asked is that a big part of effective leadership is both recognizing and learning from mistakes. From right. your perspective, looking back, what stands out to you as his greatest leadership mistake and how did he grow as a leader from it? Well, um, I think uh, I'm sure that we could get into all kinds of things like Catherine Pass and various things that went on before. Uh, you know, uh, during the war, but we could use a more contemporary example too, because he uh, didn't have much time to um, affect a turnaround. And that was um, the shooting down of the U-2 um, and in 1960. And uh, this was the last year of his presidency. Uh, the Soviet Union knew that uh, the United States of America was, had a, a reconnaissance aircraft that was flying over the Soviet Union to make sure that they weren't preparing for war. I think an important part of that story is that the Soviet Union had been given the opportunity to do the same overflights over the United States, but declined. In any case, uh, because we were um, in a very tense situation with the Soviet Union over uh, the, one of the Berlin crises, known as the Berlin Ultimatum, Soviet Union uh, shot down this airplane. And, and the mistake here, is that Ike's instincts had told him not to authorize that flight. And uh, he should have listened to his instincts. And he knew the minute he got this news that nothing had ever felt quite right about it because it threatened um, the holding or the successful outcome of a summit in Paris. Uh, he later though, I mean, uh, as soon as everything was recalibrated and it was understood what the Soviet Union knew, he stood up and took full responsibility for it. His advisors were saying, listen, um, uh, call this plausible deniability, but for heaven's sakes, don't you know, uh, affect the American presidency by standing up that way. And he said, no, no, you don't understand. The American presidency has to represent credibility and it has to represent a s system that functions where the president of the United States actually knows what's going on in his own government. So he stood up there and it was another example of uh, taking the political heat for it. Uh, but I think we can look back on the fact that uh, people make mistakes, uh, but he handled it in a, um, a dignified and actually exceedingly responsible way. So he's well known for concerns about the military industrial complex. And you write um, um, fascinating, a fascinating uh, expose about that. How would he reflect on today's militarization of space and the increased use of uh, cyber terrorism as a means of inter intergovernmental warfare. Yeah, well, I'll tell you, I think he would have uh, a lot of thoughts on that. I was always um, admonished by my father, though, to be careful about not trying to put words into the mouth of somebody who's been gone for so long. But uh, having written a book about some of his principles, I think we can just start right there. 
You know, Eisenhower um, was deeply, deeply concerned about divisions in our democracy. If you look at part of his speech during the Little Rock crisis, um, when he sent the 101st Airborne Division to um, desegregate Central High School, uh, he says at the end, you know, that this is a, this is a blight on America uh, to, in the international community. Um, and, um, you know, this reflected an idea he had earlier where he said these deep divisions are a welcome site for an alert enemy. Um, so he, would, he might think today, in looking around, that we've given a roadmap to the people who uh, are our adversaries overseas. And that first of all, uniting this country is a national security issue and has to be put at the top of the, uh, at the, top of the list. Um, and then I think um, that um, uh, cybersecurity is one of those uh, very dangerous areas. He tried to negotiate with the Soviet Union around arms control. And in a way, um, cyber, it's not existential in the way uh, the use of nuclear weapons is, uh, but it is a weapon of mass disruption, and that disruption can cause loss of life. And uh, I think he would be very uh, disturbed that we're not making a bigger effort in the international community to find rules of the road and to define uh, that where the red line is uh, when some activity becomes an act of war. The fact that there's so much ambiguity out there actually makes things rather unstable. Makes good sense. Uh, back to the question of uh, judicial appointments. A question uh, asked is, did he have a civil rights philosophy as it came to the appointment of people to the court? Yes, well, he, he most certainly did. And um, I think the centerpiece of his great civil rights legacy are the judges he appointed. Um, while he was uh, busy bringing ideological balance to the, the bench in general, um, he um, made it very clear that white supremacists need not uh, apply for the job. Um, Herb, Herb Brownell, uh, his attorney general, who felt very strongly about this uh, as well, was a real watchdog to make sure that the kind of court appointments that we had um, would uh, not only uh, uphold uh, the, you know, Brown versus Board of Education, um, but be in um, general emotional sympathy too with uh, you know, the strides the Eisenhower administration uh, made in, the, in building a civil rights platform. Bob, you know, it might interest a lot of people if I could just add this very quickly back to the knowing what you control and what you don't control. Ike's objectives for um, his um, presidential term slash term slash terms, because when he said this, he didn't know whether he'd have a second term, was to uh, desegregate everything the federal government controlled um, and, the, and to create a precedent, therefore, where the progress made in that area could not be rolled back. Um, and I think that's a very little understood um, aspect of his civil rights um, uh, strategy. But if you think about it, uh, the first thing he does when he gets a chance and talks about it in the beginning of his presidency is to desegregate Washington, D.C. And why Washington, D.C.? Because the federal government controlled Washington, D.C. Hoping to set a precedent. Uh, and he desegregated uh, D.C. schools before we even got to Brown versus Board of Education. But that was his commitment, was to try and desegregate as much of the federal government as possible. And, and he was pretty successful at that, too. Yes, sorry. And as you said, set a framework for what would follow. What would follow. Then, of course, you get uh, his appointment, Earl Warren, uh, then uh, gets, uh, you know, uh, the court uh, rules on Brown versus Board of Education. And then with the 1957 Civil Rights Act and all these other things occurring, including federal contracting, then it all comes to a head in Little Rock in 1957. Um, so back to the middle way a little bit. A question is, so he was being criticized from all sides. How did he avoid becoming more partisan as a result of that? You know, um, I just think he had, you know, obviously, I, I think he just had, he had a, a philosophy about uh, a cause larger than himself. Uh, he was very, uh, I would call him, he was an optimistic fatalist, um, certainly about his own fortunes. And he says to a number of his wartime colleagues throughout the war, you know, a man just has to forget his own fortunes. You know, we are here to do a job. Uh, as a matter of fact, during the Suez crisis, which occurs just as the 1956 campaign is underway, all the way up to election day, um, 
as the thing was coming to a head, he said to my father and uh, wrote to one of his closest personal friends, well, if I lose the election, I lose the election. Um, you know, that's what I mean by um, fatalism, but uh, he always projected optimism, so it's gotta be some kind of crazy mix of the two. <laughs> uh, you mentioned the Suez crisis, and one of the questions is, what did his, how did his personal relationships affect the way he handled that crisis and the aftermath? Well, uh, without getting into a long dissertation on the Suez crisis, which is an absolutely fascinating uh, case study, um, the bottom line is in, um, you know, with the uh, crisis developing uh, over the Suez Canal that was a result of a, a number of um, background issues, our allies, that's in France, uh, Britain, and Israel, actually double-crossed the United States and did so in a way that was unacceptable to the President of the United States, putting aside the fact that these were our wartime allies and, and uh, Israel, of course, it uh, was uh, you know, the nation of the displaced Jews from, from Europe and elsewhere. Um, so uh, he took a very tough stand because uh, he was upholding international law um, uh, at Suez and uh, our former allies were trying to overthrow um, <clears throat> President Nasser of Egypt. Um, how did he do this? He put the squeeze on him, I mean, <laughs> literally and figuratively, and um, actually uh, caused enough uh, economic disruption in those countries that uh, uh, our own allies had to come to the bargaining, bargaining table with the United States of America. Now, this might all sound, again, very strange and very... Uh, um, something like uh, a page out of history, but there's a principle behind it. And I'm just going to paraphrase this, but he said during the campaign, he says, as long as we have one rule for ourselves and our allies and one rule for everyone else, there will never be peace. Mm. Uh, in any case, his, um, because he did have a good relationship uh, with the countries writ large, uh, after uh, our allies uh, came back into line, we were able to rebuild strong relations, of course, with Britain and France and also Israel. But this was a, a real, uh, this was a real tr crisis. I think you know in the book, he had personal relationships with the leaders of those countries, and that was part of what helped rebuild those um, right. modern national relationships. Someone asks, asks a broad question about how he would think about responding to today's pandemic. Um, what would he view the role of the federal government being in a situation like this? Okay, well, again, um, I can hear my uh, late father's uh, voice in my head, but I can say um, two things uh, I feel pretty much for sure. Uh, time and time again, you see him saying, and this is a middle road, uh, uh, a middle way approach to this, but um, states have responsibilities except when they are unable to assume those responsibilities financially or otherwise. Uh, so I think you could take from that principle, which appears a couple of times in my book, uh, that he would be deeply concerned that the federal government is not offering any state, uh, any aid uh, at the moment to state and local governments. I mean, this is, I, I don't think he would understand this. That's my own opinion. Um, and then uh, the other thing I can tell you for absolute certain uh, is that he would have gotten the best scientific minds into the White House and followed their advice. Um, we know this um, actually because of how I handled the pandemic, the uh, Spanish flu influenza there in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, he got some doctors around him and they hatched a plan to um, create a quarantining system, which wasn't even being used in the United States Army at the time. Huh. Um, I mean, it was a, uh, an example of best practices of pandemic response. Um, and at the age of 28 or 29, something like that, he won the Distinguished Service Medal for not only the tank training unit, but also for his management of the Spanish flu um, pandemic. I had so it's a great chapter. That. Yeah. That is fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Gettysburg plays such a huge role in all these various stages of, of his life, including uh, the White House years when he brought so many of uh, the world's leaders um, to, to the farm there and presumably to the campus too, to uh, you know, try and um, soften them up and to understand that uh, everybody's got homes they love and families they love and communities that they're part of. And 
Uh, it certainly um, softened up Nikita Khrushchev <laughs> in 1959 when he came during that summit. But the house that's, uh, you know, three miles from the college campus was really um, what I would call the inner Camp David. So that's, that's what he used when the Camp David uh, effort, you know, was not, you know, not fully successful. Why Gettysburg? Was that because of his experience at Camp Colt? Was that because of its historical importance given the Civil War, some combination of both? But why Gettysburg? Well, I think it was a combination of all those two things that you mentioned, but we can also add to the fact that it was close to Washington, D.C., because he was still being called upon to help with one thing or another. Uh, he, loved, he loved the countryside. He wanted very much to have animals, <clears throat> and he loved horses the most, <laughs> even in bad times. Um, but uh, I, I think it was a combination of all those things. And then Mamie, uh, who was really a city girl, um, and uh, she uh, didn't ha exactly have what I'd call an exercise regime. You know, she wasn't an outdoorsy type at all. But uh, she fell in love with that farm. Um, she said it was the geranium on the windowsill in the kitchen. Um, but whatever it was, <laughs> the two of them felt very comfortable and they had been together with their first son, um, Dow Dwight, who died at the age of three, but they'd all been together there during that period. And, and Bob, you know better than all of us how fitting it is that um, the um, Eisenhower Institute is located in a building that Ike and Mamie lived in during that period of history, Absolutely. during the first war. Absolutely. Last question, and then we'll wrap up. And that is, as you did the work on this book, anything surprise you? Did you learn something new about your grandfather that you did not expect? Well, I think I sort of expected uh, most of it, but I was really very moved by um, so many things I discovered. Let me give you an example of uh, something happy that wasn't as emotional as a few other uh, items that I put into the book, but I was absolutely fascinated by the fact that he vetoed very few bills, but um, uh, among them was um, a bill he vetoed because he didn't like the way it was lobbied. Um, and he actually agreed with the substance of the bill, but he thought that the way the bill, it was an oil and gas bill, and he thought it was, um, lobbied in such a shocking way that the American public would lose confidence in the government uh, because he had signed a bill um, that was sort of corruptly handled. And wow, I thought, way to go. <laughs> uh, I think in, in, in just in closing on that comment, the thing that um, just struck me over and over again is that for all of the pressure, the challenges, the terrible dark things he saw during the war and the rest of it. Uh, he never lost his optimism uh, and he never became hard or cynical. And that was emotional. Well, Susan, um, I began this by noting that the book reflects a set of principles that are both timeless and timely. And I wanna end at least my comments today by thanking you for illustrating that as poignantly and as effectively as you have. Um, we are in a moment where leadership clearly matters. It always does. Um, but we have challenges in our society today that demand effective leadership, um, not just in government, but across all sectors of society. And the book that you have written speaks not only to leadership, which is, I know, the fundamental orientation of the book, but as you said, it speaks to character, it speaks to values, it speaks to uh, foundational principles of our democracy. And so I think you've done a real service to us in lifting our sights, broadening our, broadening our intellectual horizons as we reflect on this. Um, I really urge folks, if you haven't had a chance to read it, please do. It's a, um, it is a remarkable book. It is one that will cause you to reflect on where we are and where we should go as a society. So Susan, thank you for the book. Thank you for your many contributions to this college. Thank you for your commitment to our students. Uh, we are a better place for all that you and your family have done for us. So with that, I turn to you for your final thoughts and reflections that you'd like to leave our audience with tonight. Well, I just wanna say again uh, that I wrote this book um, so that uh, rising generations, and, and I had, of course, my class of students uh, in mind, but I, I sincerely mean it, the rising generations we'll get to know this principled leader um, and to reflect on the fact that with um, a 
commitment inside yourself as I can, deep inside yourself to change things, that you can do it. Um, and that Ike, in a way, has a lot to say to us all still. Well, he does, and your book reflects it in an accessible and powerful way. Susan, thank you so much for tonight's thank conversation you. and for your contribution. Uh, members of the audience, thank you so much for joining us, uh, participating in this Eisenhower Institute event. Uh, please watch the ongoing schedule. There's a remarkable programming that the Eisenhower Institute does. Uh, please be part of it and um, uh, very much look forward to the next session. Susan, again, thank you. Thank you all. Uh, be safe and good night. Good night. Bye-bye.